The Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies presents the Pearl of Great Price Lecture Series, given by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Today's lecture is entitled, Abraham. Now, in Jewish tradition and all tradition, it's a complete leap from Noah to Abraham. But they're aware of that leap. There's nobody comes in between. So it's very proper that our book of Moses, which is really the Enoch story leading up to Noah and the flood, is followed with the eighth chapter is book of Noah. Quotations, there's a whole page from the book of Noah. So we get actual excerpts from books uh, from each of the major dispensations. The thing we want to notice here, how does it end up? How does the whole thing end up after this first phase? You notice you divide just as you do in, uh, in astronomy and in geology. You, you divide up into ages, into eons, into epochs, smaller and little ones, just as you divide into uh, uh, the, the epic, the, uh, the trilogy, the single play, the acts, the scenes, etc. Well, so it is here. <clears throat> and this ends, this is a big ending. This is one of those big breaks. And you notice when it happens, right at the end of our book of Moses, the earth was corrupt before God and was filled with violence. My Hamas is violence, which of course is the sign of our world today, both corrupt and filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Behold, I will destroy all flesh from off the earth. That's what they want, that's what they'll get. And that's what we're moving toward right now. But this takes us right to, to Abraham then, doesn't it? See what notes here. So it reaches the climax. Incidentally, uh, the Enoch story, well, as you know, it reaches its climax in the flood. Now, after the flood, we just repeat the Adam story again. Just as Adam found himself in the lone and dreary wasteland outside and had to work his head off to make things going, Noah also found himself in the well, uses the very same word in the Bible. After the flood, nothing was growing, he found himself in the Mithbar, in a desert world. <coughs> and he built an altar. Remember the first thing he did? The affair of the rainbow. Then what did he do? <coughs> he cultivated the garden. He became a gardener, as Adam did. Went to till the earth. Remember the vineyard? Noah, the first thing he did was plant a vineyard with that. And then comes a separation. Then his family grows up, they flourish, and go bad immediately, just as in the time of Adam. Already, every, the flesh becomes corrupt. You think, well, after the flood, after they learned their lesson, it would be a long time before that happened again. But you go almost immediately to the tower, because very quickly in Noah's own generation, they start misbehaving. And uh, so we get the tower, and a period known as the separation. Now, you notice you have the diaspora. This is the separation. The diaspora is the scattering of the Jews. The, both that when the temple was destroyed, the time of a scattering in the time of the first temple, time of Lehi. Then again, when the Romans destroyed in AD 70, there have been scatterings and there have been gatherings, as the Book of Mormon tells us, from time to time. Well, but this separation is the biggest of all. This is the scattering of all the people, where it tells us about the Tower of Babel and the, the three sons in the 14th chapter of Genesis. Spring is here in this too. Well, the, uh, this is called the separation, and there is no scripture for this. This is very interesting. This huge gap between Noah and Abraham, and the formula goes, familiar formula, ten generations from Noah to Abraham, and there was no one who called upon the Lord. So then Abraham starts things moving again after this one. So this separation, uh, this is very interesting that this is the best documented of all periods in the ancient records. This is where the Egyptian Babylonian records, the lamentation literature, the admonitions and so forth, they fill in the gap. We have all sorts of contemporary literature in this early period of the scattering of the people in all directions. And we have the, uh, and we have a scripture provided for it. Isn't that lucky? The only person that gave it to us is Joseph Smith. It was a book of ether. That fills that gap, you'll notice there. And fortunately, it is the most easily controlled of all, because I say at this particular period, during this gap, the Jewish literature is silent, the Christian literature is silent, all the rest is, but the non-Jewish, non-Christian, the great civilizations, they give us the fullest of records. This is when the, uh, the traditions are laid for all the, the myths, the, the tragedies, the Greek tragedies, which uh, Aristotle says are just naturally tragicotron, 
tragic by nature. The, the quarrels between the great houses, uh, the scattering, the desolation, the t horrendous crimes that go on. The it's your book of ether story all over again, your Jaredite story. <clears throat> well, we get it in the Jaredite story, and of course, you can match this with all sorts of manuscripts. It's interesting that that gap that Joseph Smith has filled the separation for us. But that's not what we're concerned with now. We're, we've got to get up to Abraham. Uh, and this is this rich subsoil of, of myth and drama. Now, the Abraham story is told in Genesis uh, from chapters 11 to 25. There are over 11 chapters devoted to the life of Abraham. We don't have any other biographies that long or that full. We read about Moses between the lines. But here we have 11 chapters, some say 12, 11 chapters of the life of Abraham. What more do you need? Why do we need a book of Abraham here? This tells us a different life, a different story, which is a surprising thing. The thing is, the others has been edited by the doctors. You might as well mention that. Uh, what's more necessary? And, and what else do they tell us about Abraham? You might as well mention what the Jewish sources are. We refer to them. We put down, remember, the various sources for the Enoch literature, but we also have the same type of stuff, totally different stuff, for Abraham. And, of course, we begin with the Torah, which are the first five books of Moses. Now, this is a thing that is recognized very widely. <coughs> Moses is simply recapitulating Abraham. He picks up not only where Abraham, but he tells Abraham's story. And scholars today are inclined to think of the books of Moses as really, the book of Genesis should really be called the book of Abraham, uh, the creation story of Moses, because he just picked it up. He picked it up from Abraham, because it was revealed to Moses too, revealed in each particular dispensation. But he recapitulates Abraham all the way through. Well, anyway, the Torah, and this goes back, you see, to Moses, and this is studied, the five books of the Torah, five first books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Logic, Deuteronomy, and so forth, and this is studied by the Sopharim. The book people, the learned one, these are the scribes of the, old, of the New Testament, the scribes and Pharisees. These are the scribes, the Sopharim, that's it. Oh. And they discussed, and they uh, argued about things, and they produced a repetition or review or going over, oh incidentally next week I, I'll review, the, we're going to review the whole course and try to agree on some uh, some feasible subject for a definitive essay so we can decide what people are up to you see. Uh, so we'll, we'll review the stuff and, and then we'll see what would be a good subject to write about. But anyway the Torah, is, and so they repeated it and Mishnah means a doubling or repetition and they would examine the Torah and go through it again. Why do you have to tell the story again? Because there are many things therein that uh, is full of contradictions and leaves lots of things unsatisfied. Well, we get other stories in the Pearl of Great Price that fills in lots of those gaps. We started out saying, remember, that what the Pearl of Great Price did was fill in a lot of gaps. Well, these gaps are recognized and they're filled in by the Mishnah where they discuss and they speculate on what might have been and so forth. And the Mishnah, which means the same with H if you want, uh, the Mishnah was the work of the Tanaim, the teachers, teachings of the Mishnah. The, uh, incidentally, this goes from the 3rd century B.C. to the 3rd century A.D. And there were 148 great doctors worked on it. See, the doctors rewriting the Bible, practically. The last one, it was finally sealed up, the last thing, in the 3rd in the century uh, by Judah Hanasi. A Jew to the Prince gave us the last version of the Mishnah, but it's still studied. These things are being all reprinted today. They're being studied as never before because there's lots of information here. And uh, so you've got the Mishnah, but were the doctors right about anything? You can, <coughs> those are two ends there, yes. Uh, you can argue till the cows come home and that's what the, the doctors of the schools love to do. So you had to repeat the Mishnah and in that you have the Talmud or they start out Gemara means filling out completion. We're going to give the final definitive answer now, which is the same thing as the town of the teaching. What's happened to the Bible all this time? Now, this runs in two issues. There's the Palestinian, which ceases in the year 370. That's the last uh, uh, AD. That's the last installation there. And uh, the Palestinian and the Babylonian. That's the great one. This is three times as long as this. We have all these texts here, so you won't be required to read them before the end of the semester because they're very long. <laughs> the Babylonian Talmud, and that goes down to the 5th century AD, just 100 years later, almost 100 years later. And again, they're discussing these, and they're discussing these. And the people 
who take care of this are the uh, the doctors of the church. Summarize to be patient. They, both of these comes as sobering. It means after you've gone over a thing and exhausted, what they did was go through the Tanaim, go through the Mishnah, line by line, verse by verse, and went through everything with a fine tooth comb. They were patient, plodding, sobarim. Uh, Arabic word for patience is sabr, 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 and so forth. Job the sabr. So these were the sobarim, and the this Talmud is divided into two parts, which we all know. The one is the main part, the halakha, which is the law. The law, remember the law? Moses gives the law to the people, and they're supposed to teach the fasts and the, and the festivals and uh, the moral laws and the judgments and the courts. That, they're legalistic. That's an important part of it. The other part is the Agada. Now, these are the stories that illustrate things they could have picked up. I heard Rabbi so-and-so say so-and-so, and they'll give a long, long line of authorities to come up to determine where this story originally came from. But they're supposed to illustrate and confirm arguments and explain what's going on. These Agada have some wonderful stories in them, and the stories are gathered in the well-known Midrash. Well, no, not too well known. Uh, which means, again, like Talmud, it means teaching. Darasa, the professor, the teacher, student, to Daras is to teach. Medrasa is the council. Uh, in the Midrash, which runs, it started right in the beginning, right with the Tanim. It started in the third century BC. As soon as they started telling these stories, they started remembering them. The Jews are great on that. So from the third century BC, it went on down to the year 1040 when the schools of Babylon were. So were AD, were officially closed by the Muslims. They could no longer have any. Uh, they could no longer have any uh, schools in discussion. So it runs to that. But all these give sources, and the most interesting of all are the ones that are being revived today more than anything else. Along with this, now this is we call this the rabbinical literature. This is rabbinic. Of course, these people are rabbis too. But there is the Hasidic, which is very important. The Hasidim, the various arguments as to who they are. Uh, would it have been the original, uh, the Hasid uh, of uh, the Hasid of Regensburg, 1200, uh, Rabbi Hasid, or was it much older? They say it is. It is the Kabbalah. It's Kabbalistic. <coughs> Could put two B's in if you want. But Hasidim, of course, means grace. Uh, Hyatt, they have the old tradition that went back to Adam, the one that these people have been lousing up all along with their discussion. The reason they had so many gaps in the first place was that the doctors, the Sopharim, the scribes and Pharisees, threw out so much they didn't like. And it turns up, and they argue about things, that the Hasidic is the Kabbalah, and two main sources of that. The first, the basic one of all, is the Sefer Yatsira. Uh, here. The book of creation, supposedly written by Abraham, Abraham's original story of creation, is considered today by nearly all Jewish scholars as the most important book in existence. It is the book. Is it safe for you to hear? It's a complete mystery. It's divided into two parts. The letters, which represent, it's all in code. The meaning of the particular letters and then the emanations uh, that go forth. The, uh, the uh, seraph, the seraphot, the sephirot. The uh, ten emanations that created the world, the ten sephirot, and then the, the, the 20, 22 sacred letters. So we have Kabbalah, Sefer Yetzira, and then the the Zohar, which has the most important section, like about Abraham. It's an Abraham source. These are all good Abraham sources. They're just full of stories about Abraham. The woods are full of them. So uh, even with 11 chapters in Genesis, what were they missing? Well, it is. Uh, they, they have missed the point. And today there's a new, there's a new look. Incidentally, I'm going to mention it again. See, we have to watch the clock like crazy now. Uh, well, here we are. The series on Abraham, which is a long one, it, it, it ran from 1968 through 19, to 1970 in the era, and it's, my gosh, 200 pages. You can get it at farms for three bucks. So. Uh, uh, 200 pages, three dollars, that's less than two cents a page. That's two, one and a half cent a page, that's pretty cheap and not bad for, for Xerox. There's some useful stuff in here, and they have paged it properly and make it very easy to find things. But uh, 
can save you a lot of trouble by reading from these, which we won't have time to do. But first, to show, first of all, this new look on Abraham. This is the way they talk about him now. We quote a lot of, of uh, recent Jewish scholars, and we have been visited often here, as you know, uh, by eminent rabbis who come to discuss things. We get along famously with them. Um, it is, what have we got here? 163 ish. What do you think here? With these newfound documents, the whole picture has changed now. Whereas, we're told, of only one mortal being, Moses, does the Holy Scripture state that God spake to him face to face with all the other prophets. The deity speaks in dreams and visions and riddles, but only to Moses face to face. Today, we are told that the covenant made with Moses on Sinai is, quote, but the fulfillment of the covenant made with Abraham, which is the true foundation of the life of Israel ever since. Whereas it has been hitherto taken for granted that everyone knows that it was Moses who first knew the Eternal One, we now learn that Abraham, and not Moses, was the founder of Israel's monotheism. God is always described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of Moses. We're quoting certain rabbis writing today. The covenant of the Bnei Brith, that's the society of the covenant in, in Israel, as you know, is today considered to be, quote, the covenant that God made with Abraham, the first Jew, afterward renewed with Moses. Moses simply renewed what Abraham already had. There's nothing new they say we'll find in Moses. So this is a new attitude, the central deathless theme and constitution of Judaism. This goes on and on. Uh, and notice here, they said, aha, we've discovered something now, that Abraham, that Moses is simply continuing Abraham. Well, we could have told you that all along. And what is now in becoming clear Moses is just carrying on from Abraham here, is that Abraham is simply doing what Noah did, and Noah what Adam did. Uh, we saw Noah like the garden and so forth. That famous saying, ten generations from Noah to Abraham, this is repeated in the book of Abraham, remember? The Lord tells Abraham here, it shall be with thee as it was with Noah. You're going to carry on the work of Noah, which Abraham does. So, Noah and then Adam. And once given that pattern, see, the whole idea, as you mentioned before, was Christians and Jews alike say it's all just one act play. They're just Moses. Remember, we're quoting standard Jewish sources that tell us it was Moses and Moses alone to whom God appeared. He gave him the whole law, and that was it. And they no sooner come out with that than they begin to spawn this. Now, incidentally, these books go into volumes and volumes. They fill the shelves. You see, Babylonian tell me they're huge. And uh, as if they could never be satisfied. So more goes on. And from here, of course, there are, there, are there no prophets after Moses? Not I, we're talking about dispensations here. And then in our Pearl of Great Price, the next one is the little apocalypse, Matthew 24. Jesus Christ speaking about the dispensation that's to follow him, the coming of time, the last days. And we just saw in Enoch, remember it was Enoch, we could include Enoch here with Noah. Uh, he was his great-grandfather. Um, he says in the... Uh, the days of wickedness and vengeance. These were days of wickedness and vengeance. These were days of, of, of wickedness and vengeance, Jesus Christ. And these latter days are the days of wickedness and vengeance. So we have this totally different pattern here. And if the world would recognize that, it would save them a lot of trouble, a lot of arguing about scriptures. The uh, Abraham is regaining the esteem which he once held with the Jewish doctors who called him Arba, the greatest of the faithfulest, the Sadiq Tamim. That's what belongs down here, the Sadiq, the Kabbalah, and so forth, the, the Hasidic literature. Uh, what was there? We said, well, Kabbalah was... Covers. See, the idea of Kabbalah means transmission. Kabbalah means to receive. And Kabbalah, with a double B, means to pass on from one to another. And the whole theory of the Hasidic literature, with these very important writings in it, is that the whole tradition, the whole plan, the whole pattern was passed on among holy chosen men, men of God, from one dispensation to the next ever since Adam. That we have exactly the same teachings that Adam had. That's the teaching of the Kabbalah. The Jewish doctors reject it completely. When in 70, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, the Jewish doctors, led by Ben Yochai, went out in a, in a, a uh, delegation to the emperor Ti Titus. Well, he was a, yeah, it was Titus who did it. He was father of Vespasian. Uh, he became the emperor then. To Titus and asked him for permission to go beyond Jordan to Jamnia and found a school because they hated the temple. They rejoiced to see the temple burn. That's a surprising thing, but they did. 
There was see the r rabbis were not uh, held no priesthood. They're just learned men who are elected by the community and teach in a school. The rabbi has no priesthood at all. Uh, some are very proud of bearing the name Levi, and then they claim that they're Levites, Levites from Kohen. But simply to be a rabbi, simply to be a learned man. And they went out and established the school of Jamnia, and then you get the two great schools, the school of Jamnia and the school of Pumbadetha in Mesopotamia. And these are the schools that flourished until the 11th century, in the middle of the, of the 11th century. They went out and taught their own stuff built up the whole thing and of course it was based originally on this but they just went to town with this and condemned all this and so there was there has always been in Judaism and in dire times there has always been a uh, uh, in 1700 Baal Shem they said some say that it was Baal Shem in 1700 who was the first who was the first Hasid others say it was uh, uh, Isaac of Regensburg as a Hasid of Regensburg in, in 1200. Mm -hmm. Others say it was others. They say, no, 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 it wasn't this one, that one. The Kabbalah has been handed down since the very beginning. So we see this tension here. So there's, we have very, very much need for a book of Abraham. And, uh, well, we could go on here. He is the first and greatest of those whose coinage is current in the entire world, who colonized the world for God. So that whereas before Abraham, the Lord was king of heaven only, with Abraham he became the king of heaven and earth. God depends on Abraham to make him king of earth and so forth. Abraham entered into a covenant on which the world is based, says the Zohar there. And thus the world was firmly established for his sake, saying if it hadn't been for Abraham, God wouldn't have created the world and so forth. So this new status of Abraham is an important thing, the new new view of him. Uh, see what we have here. It says, uh, and uh, uh, the Oh, this is about the new evidence that's come out and so forth. Here's an interesting statement where he says, Anna Abraham qualifies to stand as the most pivotal and strategic man in the course of world history. Everything pivots around Abraham. Abraham makes all the difference. And you see in this second verse of the book of Abraham how loaded it is. Notice how long it is in one single sentence. Notice there's not a break in, the, in it. You can't put a break. It all goes together. It's a very strange sentence. It's a very potent, very powerful. This gives the whole mission of Abraham and it explains his importance. When the world gets lost, as I say, the ten generations again. Let's see now. The uh, he is he starts out in the land of the Chaldeans at the residence of my father I Abraham. We haven't ended with it by any means here. Now we have the apocalyptic literature, which is uh, apocryphal. Uh, I say apocalyptic is the correct word. Uh, for Abraham has been found since the middle 18th century, 19th century, two special works, the, the Apocalypse of Abraham and the Testament of Abraham, enormously important works, the most important yet discovered, very old, very closely related to our book of Abraham. They, they give us a complete surprise. They're being, com they're being gone over today. And they're, they come in in the apocalyptic writings. And uh, they include, they're the, uh, the Ab Abra and the Test Abra. But there are many other things beside. These are these are the most important ones. But this writing comes out now very early, and it gives us this picture. The uh, and the again, the Haggadah. The Haggadah are extremely rich in stories of Abraham's childhood and what he suffered, how he protested with his family, how they did try to put him to death. How how well we go into all the stories about that here. There's no need repeating it now, and and why they did it that uh, Abraham it was the Ur up in the north there. And uh, he protested with his family. He says here, they utterly refused to listen to my voice. And they were going to have the annual celebration when they have to make a proxy, always a proxy, a sacrifice for the king who doesn't want to be sacrificed himself. This was a, they would always choose the, the proxy at this particular time and place. And all the details are very well set forth in the book of Abraham. Notice this first chapter is greatly concerned with ritual. The whole thing is ritual, ceremony, and religion. See, this answers the historical question. Could this really happen? You bet it happens. This is exactly what they did. Uh, Wainwright has written a very good book on the, the old the star religion of Egypt, which is revived from time to time, especially it would be at this time. Nobody can date Abraham. They're dating between 600 A.D. and uh, 2600 A.D. There's a gap of 2,000 years, uh, B.C. rather, excuse me, uh, a gap of, of 2,000 years in the present day dating of Abraham. One scholar at Yale says, uh, puts him 600 B.C. Others put him, because of Ebla, put him 26, 2800. That puts him way back. Well, with that sort of a gap, 
Time doesn't mean a thing. You're not going to get any, anywhere arguing about uh, chronology. You say, oh, look, this book's Abraham in the wrong time. Nobody knows when Abraham was, as far as that goes. But these, these things richly, they happen every year all the time, but it's also history. What, re, what is performed on a national scale with great, uh, with great panache and splendor and so forth and to do is a historical event. In fact, it's the most historical event. It is the most historical event. Uh, war is merely a side issue. There are wars, you see, with Ramses II were small-time affairs. And, uh, but they were ritual, especially with these very clear in, in Rome. Every, every part of the act of Rome, of, of uh, war, is, is part of the annual rites of going forth and so forth and so on. Well, so here he starts out that he's got to leave home. And all his life he has to keep going. Ab the Ten Trials of Abraham. Abraham was never able to settle at all. Remember, he is buried in, he has to rent ground to bury his wife and a tomb at Hebron where Abraham is supposed to be buried. Remember, he had to ba uh, borrow, he had to buy the land from the, the Hittite Ephraim. The Hittites owned that, our well-speaking Hittites, you might say, owned that uh, territory at the time, and he got his own, even for his grave, everywhere he has to keep moving. That's why the book later, uh, uh, in the Zohar, the book uh, about Abraham, as in the, in the Midrash, Gather Midrash, Midrash Rabba, is entitled Leif Leka, meaning get up and get going, keep going. Abraham always has to keep going. Remember, it's the famine drives him. There was corn in Egypt, and so they keep moving. And there was always, uh, um, always has to settle on foreign land. He's always in trouble wherever he goes. And he always does the generous and magnanimous thing. What a marvelous man. He has every trial you can imagine. And this is, this is his motivation here, what keeps him going. Because he, he has a vision of something else. He you knows something else beside the, the regular routines of this world. A new place of residence. Well, he looks around, of course, and he finds that there is greater happiness and peace and rest for me than he has at home, understanding. He has to find a, a, another place of residence because he hasn't got enough happiness and peace and rest. That's what he wants, and frankly, that's what he's seeking for himself, he says. Greater happiness and peace and rest for me. Nothing wrong with that. Anak wedges senab. That's the, that's the formula the Egyptians use after the name of the king. Some people put it after their names, after the burial. Uh, means life and security and peace and prosperity. So he seeks for the blessings of the fathers. That's the only way it can come in the blessings of the fathers. And now he emphasizes the fathers here and, and the patriarchal order. Uh, whereunto I might be ordained to administer the same. He wants, notice, happiness, peace, and rest for me. Uh, I think we might describe the world of Abraham. It's a very important thing because it's the same as the world in these others, but it's, it's particularly vivid in the case of Abraham. Maybe we'll read a few uh, examples of what, what, the, what was going on in the world of Abraham. Oh boy, don't we? Have one for one here? Yes. First, hard times, a very, very hard times. You had to go to save the ten trials of Abraham. And we go through them here. Listen to, the, listen to the situation he has in the, in the Bible here. This is on page 149, what he goes through. Uh, his life is an unbroken te uh, series of tests, right up to his death. Right, he's, the Lord never... He says, uh, the saying is, Rabbi was with, like a son, a devoted son, who was ceaselessly beaten by his father. But he says, let him go on beating. He knows what he's doing. For you. Uh, Abraham knew the law of obedience. But first of all, quote, Sarah was barren. She had no child. Then... The Lord to him, get thee out of thy country. And this is Genesis 11 and 30. Then Genesis 12 and 1. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. He has to get going. 9 and 10. Going still southward and there was famine in the land. And nothing to eat. That's one of the reasons everybody's moving now. And then he gets to Egypt and what happens? The Egyptians beheld the woman and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. His wife was taken away from her. And then Pharaoh said, when he, when he finds that Abraham was her husband after all, Pharaoh was indignant. He says, What is this that thou hast done unto me? And they sent him away. In the 13th chapter, And the land was not able to bear them, and there was strife. His men fight with Lot's, his, his nephew Lot's men, because there's not enough grass for the flocks, and they have a terrible time, and they poison wells and things like that going on all the time. And there was strife. And then the, the five desert chiefs come and make, made war, the way they're always zeroing in on Israel today. From five directions. And they take Lot and his goods, and took them away, and uh, Abraham had to bring them back again. He said, I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Still no child. And then the sacrifice of Abraham. He's still a young man at this time. 
when he was sacrificed, our facsimile one here, lo, a horror of great darkness fell on him. The other accounts of it describe what the sacrifice was. And then his wife has this terrible affair with Hagar, all this squabbles at home, the 15th chapter, uh, 16th chapter. She says to him, the great, the marvelous Sarah, his wife, my wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid unto thy bosom, and I was despised in her eyes, and the Lord judged between me and thee. She wouldn't judge, but see, she had, because Abraham was childless, she allowed him to take another wife, Hagar. And uh, then Hagar started uh, making snide remarks, because she, went, she had a son, and uh, making life miserable for Sarah. Not a happy domestic situation. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, those terrible cities, but he pleads for them. He tries to get them saved, as you know. There are only ten righteous people. Would you please save them? And he abases himself before the Lord. Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Oh, let not the Lord be angry. Then came the, the big nuclear blast, and the next morning he looked out from his camp high above, of course. He, he had chosen the bad ground above, so Lot could take the good ground below. It's a good 1,500 foot level, and you look down the whole valley, and you look down, it was just like a furnace. It says, uh, flickering fires, all full of smoke and, and uh, dust and so forth, as if there'd been some tremendous blast going on. There was uh, most active uh, volcanic and, uh, and earthquake is on the world down the rift there, down, down the, uh, which they used to call it the great, uh, it, it was the, the Gulf of Aqaba leads right up in, into the Jow. Well, anyway, so lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And then, so he gets out of that, he moves to the coast to be safe. After that explosion, it wasn't safe to be where he was. So then he took his family and went to the coast and the king of Gerar, Abimelech, was in charge there. They got along all right, but he took Sarah to wife again. Sarah was a raging blonde and a terrific beauty, they tell us, but that wasn't the reason. They wanted to raise up a royal line by her. She, her name means Princess Queen. And then he's in trouble again. They will slay me for my wife's sake. And then he has to get rid of Hagar, his wife, his, who had the son Ishmael. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar and sent her out away to die in the desert. That was no fun. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of the well of water, which Abimelech's servant had violently taken away. And then comes the supreme test, the sacrifice of Isaac. Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him there for a burnt offering. And then finally, at the end of his life, in the 23rd chapter, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me permission of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead. Well, that's the career of Abraham from the beginning to the end. He's a wanderer. And uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, you're supposed to come forth Make a basket of fruit, all the, of the goodness the Lord has given you, assume, and you're supposed to bring that to the altar. Every man is supposed to do this and say, Our father was a wandering Syrian, an outcast, a tramp. Uh, he was an Amor Amorite, the word they use. And you brought him to this blessed land and gave him this. But this was Abraham. He was the outcast. Uh, that's what Abar means. Uh, well, Abraham high. But Hebrew, it, it says my, my father was a Hebrew, the word Hebrew. Avar, Avar means the person from the beyond, a wanderer, a, an alien, a stranger, a person without a passport, is an Avar, is an Hebrew. And the Hebrews have been that ever since. That's what they are, wandering, settling, getting into trouble and so forth. It's an interesting history. It all goes back to Abraham here. So, why the sacrifice of Abraham here? Now, this is the situation here because of this confounded drought in the spirit. There have been periods, we know now, major climatic change in the earth, and in Abraham's time, it was terribly bad. Remember, it says, for there was famine in the land, and they moved on. They could not settle in Canaan. They still had to move on into Egypt. The reason they went into Egypt was because there was corn in Egypt. The only place they could buy corn was in Egypt, and that's why Joseph sent his sons into Egypt later. There was a, a terrible time of drought, that, that whole period, and we have. They say the lamentation from this time when the Nile failed to rise, if Egypt was the only place to find grain and they didn't have any in Egypt, you were hard up. And, and the vivid, full descriptions it gives from these early times in the Egyptian record, the, the famine stela, and uh, the one called the admonitions of an Egyptian sage, and Neferohu, descriptions of how bad things could get in Egypt and what happens. They're very interesting ones. But this is the world of Abraham. Well, they have to make sacrifice, they have to do something about it, and they do, and Abraham goes up and, uh, and he is to be offered. And the whole theme of the Abraham story is, in the book of Abraham, is the rivalry between Abraham 
and Pharaoh. As to the priesthood and kingship, that's why Pharaoh, we're told, Midrash wanted to marry Sarah to raise up a, a righteous line, uh, which is what uh, Abraham wanted to do too. So he took Sarah away because she was the princess in the light. He was to, uh, he was to raise up the line. But there is this constant conflict between the two, and you notice in the first part, Abraham tries to sacri uh, Abraham is sacrificed on the altar in the place of Pharaoh, which was considered a great honor at this time. Uh, this is, goes back to the Sed Festival. The most important festival in Egypt was the Sed Festival. From prehistoric times, you find that the earliest monuments of Egypt have the Sed Festival. There are Sed Festival monuments over in the museum there now. The Sed was the celebration originally at the end of 30 years, when the king started to get old and feeble at the end of 30 years, was the Sed. And so the king had to be sacrificed, and then he would be restored in his son, Horus, who would reg be regarded as the resurrected version of the king. Uh, he would disappear for three days, and suddenly he would come out as Horus, as himself. Well, it was convenient also to uh, come forth uh, without being put to death that way, and just disappear uh, for a while, and then come forth and have somebody else put to death in your place. So you have the, the sacrifice, you have the, the proxy, which is done, and the, the rules are very strict, and uh, they were followed here, and there are a great many instances of, uh, of this happening. Abraham was chosen, as I say, it was considered a great honor. You had to be a noble, and you had to be a stranger, and you had to either have yellow or red hair. They preferred red hair to anything else, so you're in real danger if you visit Egypt. The redhead visit Egypt, look out there. Uh, Brother Craig. Uh, the, uh, and th this is the story told that, uh, you notice the tarts out telling us it gives the four, gives four gods in Canaan. Those are the four gods of Canaan that rule, rule the four parts. And at that time, Canaan, it says it, uh, it says in the book of Abraham, it says, at this time, he were, was under the, uh, yes, now at this time, it was the custom of the priest of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to offer up upon the altar, which was built in the land of Chaldea, the offerings under these strange gods, men, women, and children. Well, the, uh, what was the Egyptian king doing in Chaldea? Well, as you know, in the 18th dynasty, as you know, Ramses II. What was he doing up there at Megiddo and so forth? We conquered that Egypt. That was Egyptian country in those days. That's where this was, Chaldea. And uh, it was a temporary time. At the time Abraham wrote this, or at the time his children were supposed to read it, apparently it was no longer Egyptian empire. It came and went, depending. You see, uh, the, uh, in the 18th dynasty, Ramses, the, uh, rather Thothmes III, took the whole shebang clear over to the to the Euphrates and so forth, and they lost it all, and then they got it back again, the 20th dynasty. Then finally, uh, in the 22nd dynasty, uh, the great uh, Shishank went out and conquered it all again, claimed to have conquered it, and even more, and so forth. And then it was lost again, and then Alexander the Great took the name of Shishank and said he was the son of Ammon, made himself pharaoh, and went back and conquered the whole thing again, following the very same pattern. These men, each one of these conquerors, called himself a cosmocrator. The story of the cosmocrator is important because because Abraham's rival Pharaoh is always calls himself the Cosmocrator. You know what that would be. The cosmos is the world, the universe, and the Krator is a person who rules. The Cosmocrator. It's, it's, a very, it's a Greek title, but this is a Latin form. The Cosmocrator was the man who claimed to rule the world as God's successor on, on earth. And the mortal rival of Abraham was a Cosmocrator who went by the name of Nimrod. And the, all the legends say that the the Pharaoh who tried to sacrifice Abraham was this Nimrod. And you know the Nimrod, the mighty hunter of the Bible, is it the same one? That's a long story, we won't go into it. But the point is that Abraham in the, in the legends has this rivalry with uh, this mortal right with the person who claims to have the priesthood and the kingship. Does he have the right to rule and does he have the, the priestly right? Well, that's what Abraham had and that's what Pharaoh coveted. And you notice when he tries to sacrifice Abraham, now this is the story that, there, that is told in the, in the Midrash here, that Abraham was put on the altar and as the, and the fire was ready, see they always, you first cut the throat of the victim and then you cast him on the fire. It was always done that way. The two of them, the fire was ready. You notice Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Isaac was carrying the wood, the wood for the fire. But Abraham raised the knife. It was a sacrificial knife and then the fire follows. Well, as the priest raised the knife, a great mighty earthquake struck it overthrew the altar, it killed the priest, and Abraham wasn't touched. 
<laughs> well, of course, this impressed the king, who immediately let him go. And he didn't have to sacrifice. He didn't have to sacrifice Abraham anymore because the sacrifice had always been already been made. The high priest was the, the substitute. After all, if one had been sacrificed, so he had no argument with Abraham, and he did honor Abraham by letting him sit on his throne. And we're told that when Abraham they built this, they took the wood as they had brought first the people. The Pharaoh had ordered the people all to bring wood, cedar wood, and bring an enormous bonfire to burn Abraham on. And then the priest's knife is cast from his hand, the priest is overthrown, he's killed, and uh, Abraham is let go. And then, he said, he orders them to gather wood and build a special throne uh, to put Abraham's throne on. And then he said he had all the children, 365 highest nobles of the land, come with their children to Abraham to sit on the throne and be taught the principles of astronomy by Abraham. Well, that's what we have here, you see. We say a figure one, Abraham sitting upon Pharaoh's throne by the politeness of the king with the crown on his head, representing the priesthood, that is the priestly crown, notice the two, the two feathers, that is the spiritual crown, the shoe feathers, and emblematical of the grand presidency in heaven with a scepter of justice and judgment. And then it says, Abraham is reasoning upon the principles of astronomy in the king's court. And we're told that that's exactly what he did. We're told in the Midrash Rabbah that after the, uh, well, it's in the Beit HaMidrash. I have the Beit HaMidrash text, uh, uh, 100, page 140, as a matter of fact, in the fifth volume, uh, that he uh, sat upon the throne by Abraham's permission and all the court brought their children to be instructed in the principles of astronomy. He began, we're told, he began his preaching, blessed be God who created the sun, the moon, and the planets. And that's the way he began his sermon to the children of the Egyptians after Pharaoh had uh, accepted Abraham. Of course, he accepted Abraham at court and becomes a great favorite with him. Then you have the story of, of Sarah and the like. He took Sarah to wife in or because remember, he said, she's my sister, and this has lots of meanings. But uh, he wanted to raise up a wife by Sarah, who was the princess, the queen. And uh, Sarah had was true to her husband, to the law of her husband. And with this, we have. Oh, that's the most we forgot, the most important of all. We're always mentioning the Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1950, we discover the Genesis Apocryphon, the Genesis written by Abraham. This is the Genesis. First thought to be the Book of Lamech, because the outside. Uh, the Genesis Apocryphon. And this tells the story of Abraham in Egypt with Sarah. And it goes, really goes into things. Give us some insights into Egyptian doings. And this, remember, is from the first century. This goes back 2,000 years. It's an old story. What did it, this is all much later than that. Why did the rabbis throw this away? They had it. This is in a Jewish source. It's written, uh, this happens to be written in Aramaic. Uh, and this tells the story. Of course, he wanted to have Sarah for his wife. But uh, they had made the covenant to each other. And, and Abraham, in this, in this story, the Genesis Apocryphon, uh, this is the... Uh, is that what they, what do they call it now? I guess it's, it's first page, IQ. I guess it is Jen, Jen Apocryphal. I, IQ Jen, yes, I think it is, yeah. Well, <coughs> Abraham, outside the castle, uh, the palace walls all night, prays to God to spare Sarah. And Sarah, she also finds herself on the king's bed. Now it says this is a, this is a, um, a bed. It's the Egyptian standard bed. You see it out there all over there. It is also an altar. <coughs> it is the standard form of Egyptian altar. It is also an embalming table. You see, you can use it for, for all these things. And it is also a table for birth. We have many representations where king or queens, Queen Hatshepsut, for example, is, <coughs> is being born. Her mother is on one of these beds. So this is where life be is conceived, where it begins, where it ends. Everything happens on a couch, always shaped like the lion here, the lion couch who represents the processes of destruction in the earth, who represents the second principle, uh, where everything returns back to the earth. It's the lion that consumes all things, the fierce lion. But the, uh, so he prayed outside and she prayed inside. And uh, at the last minute, remember, with the understanding that if she didn't submit to Abraham, of course, she would be put to death. That was understanding. You don't refuse, you don't refuse Pharaoh that way. So she prayed and Abraham prayed and just as, uh, as, a, as Pharaoh was to approach her, an angel came to the rescue at the last minute, as he comes, exactly as he comes to the rescue of Abraham at the last minute. Now, this is told here in the Genesis 
a better proper date now, around 19, 1950. So it's not a recent, uh, an ancient text, as far as we know about it. It's the oldest we have, it's the most recently discovered. Uh, just like this, it goes through the whole thing. Uh, the angel comes and he, with a whip, and he forbids uh, uh, um, Pharaoh to take another step. And the Bible tells us this, Pharaoh and all his house became barren. He couldn't approach it. All animals, nothing, until he had finally delivered Sarah and returned her to Abraham. And then he sent Abraham out of the land loaded with royal gifts as a prince. He recognized him as a prince. Especially, he recognizes Sarah. He sends her out as a queen with a crown, with a robe, and all the rest of it, and he sends him on his way. But as we're told in a story uh, in the Agata, it tells us that once Abraham, uh, Pharaoh was riding in his chariot with Joseph, and he says, Joseph, you're my best friend, but I'm going to have to ask you to step down from the chariot. You can. Because when the people cheer as we go through the street, I don't know whether they're cheering me or you. Now he says, I understand uh, that... Uh, you're very popular and so far, but in Egypt there can only be one king, uh, there can only be one high priest, there can only be one ruler, as there can only be one God. And so we don't want to confuse the issue, will you please get down? Well, this is the thing that happens, uh, that happens all along. So they have, have the same thing here. Uh, Pharaoh actually says to Abraham, he says, uh, after he's rescued from the flames, Pharaoh, now this is a Babylonian version, from the, not from the Talmud, but from, from Babylon. Uh, when Abraham is miraculously delivered from the altar, uh, the Pharaoh, who is Nimrod over there too, he wants, he says, I recognize your God. I want to make a sacrifice to him. I want to sacrifice 4,000 oxen to him. And uh, it's an embarrassing situation. Abraham says, I'm, I'm glad you, you do recognize him, but you can't do that. You don't have the priesthood. You're not authorized to do that. You're blessed as to the kingship, but cursed as to the priesthood, which is what we have here, as you know here. 27th verse, now Pharaoh, being of a lineage by which he could not have the right to the priesthood, notice it was his lineage to blame, notwithstanding the Pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah through Ham, that would have been all right, but it happens that he claimed it through his mother. See, the Egyptian priesthood comes through the matriarchal, not the patriarchal line. And uh, he says, but oh, it's the verse preceding who blessed him with the blessings of earth. Notice, he was a good man. Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established his kingdom and judged his people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate that order of established by the fathers of the first generation. Now, that's a very important word, that imitate. You say, but look, did the Egyptians have the gospel? They have so many ordinances and things like that resembling ours. Did they? No, they didn't, but they had a darn good imitation. So if you want to know what the original was like, this is the best chance you have studying this because the imitation was a good one, but he knew he didn't have it. There, I have a section in that book on Abraham and Egypt where there are many texts in which Pharaoh is fretted and worried and doubts his authority. But here, that order established by the Father, see the patriarchal order. He's seeking earnestly to imitate the patriarchal order of the first generations, the first patriarchal reign, even the reign of Adam, who also of Noah and his father, who blessed him with the blessings of the earth and with the blessings of wisdom but cursed him as pertaining to the priesthood. He couldn't, because he came through the, the wrong line, it says. The, um, uh, through Ham, well, Ham, we're told, was a righteous man and walked with God too, uh, but Ham, it was, it was through the line of, um, of Cush. They rebelled, you see. They rebelled and left the priesthood uh, of uh, Cush and Nimrod. They rebelled and they stole this famous story of the stolen garment. The garment of the priesthood was stolen. The garment of Adam was stolen. It should have belonged to the other brethren. They, they all had an equal claim. But when they were coming out of the ark, Ham stole the garment and made a copy of it and claimed he had the priesthood for that reason. And for that reason, he was denied the priesthood until all the others should have it first. But this uh, would fame claim it from Noah. And that's the very thing we have here uh, and, and the story we have in the Genesis Apocryphon. But this Babylonian I was mentioning, where Abraham says to him, I'm sorry you can't make the sacrifice uh, because you're not authorized. You don't have the priesthood. You're blessed to the kingship, but cursed as to the priesthood. And again, the king must do what Pharaoh does here. He says, I'm sorry, I'll have to have you leave the country because you can't have two kings. If you have the true priesthood, then uh, I would have to bow to you in Egypt. I would have to, I, I would have to accede to you. And so he uh, invites him to leave with all honor, you understand. He, re he recognizes his kingship and his priesthood, but it'd be uncomfortable to have you ha by here because we can't have a rival pharaoh, we can't have a sub-pharaoh. 
Well, now, Joseph almost held that job. His great-grandson, Joseph, is going to, uh, a great-great-grandson, Joseph is, uh, is going to hold the same job and be equal, almost equal with Pharaoh. And later on, we find that the, few, uh, that the people esteemed Moses as Pharaoh later on in, in Exodus. So we have this dealing with Egypt all the way through, and people ask, well, why are we interested in Egypt? The Egyptian delegates that came over here asked, why are you people so interested in Egypt? That's why they let us have the exhibit, you know, because uh, we seem to have a, a genuine interest in Egypt. It comes out all over the place. Nephi starts giving us his record, the Book of Mormon, our greatest book, the language of the Egyptians and the learning of the Jews. And it was at that time, they rather, that was the time when, when, uh, when Demotic flourished. It was just a short period. It was a marvelous writing. It was a shorthand, the greatest little space saver you ever saw. Up in room 22 in the, uh, in the Cairo Museum, they have a remarkable inscription. It is above here. It is uh, in Egyptian here. It's in hieroglyphic. And uh, down here it's in Greek, big block, so much Greek, so much hieroglyphic. In between there's just a little strip, about eight inches wide, that has the whole record on it of both these others in Demotic. It was that conservative. That's why Nephi and the others, says, uh, and the others say, uh, Lehi, we wrote on the plates. It was very difficult. It was hard. It was hard to do. My hands got tired and so forth. I, uh, Mosiah makes his, two, uh, his sons learn to read it so they keep this so they can uh, keep the record, but th they keep the record in a, in a different uh, language. From, well, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is, t is t uh, kept in a different language, the archaic keeping of records and so forth. So we have the, oh boy, the time is up now. So we have the, uh, all these things mixed up. Well, the best thing to do is, is read the book of, uh, is read the book of Abraham. And uh, of course you have this week on Abraham, but next week we're gonna talk about the other, not the next time. Uh -uh because we still have a good deal to do. And this isn't very long. You notice the interesting thing is from, uh, he starts out, I had the Urim and Thummim, and that's how he found out about the creation. And then he starts giving us this very valuable cosmology we can't go into here. Uh, I'm still sloshing around with this stuff. There's a, this is one of the most remarkable documents in the world. And uh, we can't talk about that either. But the, the last part then is the creation. It's, it's a different creation. It's the best creation story we have, probably, the most scientific. But uh, there's, there's the Moses creation story. So there's not so terribly much to read. But oh, how it's packed with stuff. The information in there is, uh, is dynamite. 